So we are now recording. So we are here tonight, uh, generously joined by David Hand, so nature Matt. photographer and naturalist whose main interest of study is salamanders, in particular the marbled salamander. I'm not going to try to pronounce the Latin name because I don't want to embarrass myself, but he's going to be sharing some information about the life cycle of this amazing salamander through his own pictures and videos and stories of his field observations. David's work with marble salamanders has been featured in Reptiles Magazine. David, uh, apparently you live in Schoolkill County, Pennsylvania. I think I said that right. Along with Very your good. wife, Beverly, of 37 years and your two dogs, Maddie and Sam. Welcome, David. Thank you so much. Uh, we're really excited to have you here. I'm just going to quickly admit a few more folks from the waiting room and we should be good to go. I'm going to mute myself so that you uh, can have our full attention. And again, if anyone has questions, just feel free to type them into the chat or raise your hand and uh, we will take it from there. Thank you so much, David. Well, thank you to the uh, Natural History Society of Maryland for having me. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, it's, I'm very excited to do this and it's nice to see everyone. Um, that was my presentation. I hope you liked it. That's a joke. That's a presenter's joke. <laughs> So we'll get started here, and if you have any questions, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. My name is David Hand. I am a nature photographer living in western Schuylkill County, and I am here to show you pictures and video that I took of the magnificent marble salamander and bestomia of Look, because it's probably a lot of uh, I'm hearing somebody talking. Um, okay. I thought that was in your background, but yeah, that's one of our folks. I'll see if anyone needs to be muted. I can do that on my end. I am by no means an expert, but after finding my first larva some years ago in a mostly fernal, a frozen vernal pool in February, I became fascinated with this amazing creature and its life cycle. I wanted to learn all I could about the salamander through reading, but mostly through my own observations, many hours of being in the field. It turned out that day that in February that the marble larva that I found was a record for Dolphin County. You can just see them there on the leaf. And marble salamanders are unusual in that they are the only ambistomia species in our area that breeds in the fall. I should also like to, to make note that uh, marble salamanders are one of only two ambistomia species in the United States that actually breeds and lays their eggs on the ground. Um, uh, all the other Ambistomia species that I'm aware of breed in the water. So it's pretty fascinating. The other Ambistomia species that we have in Pennsylvania are the spotted Massalactum. These are females. You can see they're full of eggs. They're ready to burst. Jefferson, Jeffersonium, and blue spotted lateral. There's also a hybrid between the uh, blue spotted and the Jeffersons. They found out since the last ice age that the two have been in a reading and it's created a hybrid. All of which breed in the late winter and spring. Ambistomia pacmium are black with white cross bands across the head, back and tail. I like to tell people that they look like a checkerboard. Their coloration is like a fingerprint that in that I have never seen two with the markings and coloration exactly the same way. They can be anywhere from 77 to 127 millimeters in length. That's three to five inches. The females usually being larger. The range of the marble salamander includes most of the southeastern United States, west to Texas and Oklahoma, through the Midwest into Pennsylvania and New York and the northern limit ending in southern New Hampshire. Here in Pennsylvania, marble can be found in the south central and central counties and eastern counties as far north as Lycoming. It has also been seen in Butler County in the west, and I am sure many other counties just waiting to be discovered. Classification. Marble salamanders belong to the family of Ambistomia salamanders, also referred to as mole salamanders, because of spending their lives mostly underground. Ambis Ambistomia are characterized as being bigger salamanders with stout, heavier bodies. Adult ambistomia also have lungs for breathing air. 
reproductive strategy. Vernal pools are temporary pools that fill with water in depressions in the winter and spring from rain and snow. They play a key role in the reproductive strategy of the marbled salamander as well as other ambistomia species. A whole host of creatures depend on these fragile wet areas for a place to breed and continue their life cycle. They are free of fish that would prey on their eggs and young. You can find many kinds of frogs and other creatures all using and depending on vernal pools. Marbled arrive at the vernal pools for mating in the fall. I have found marbled at pools as early as August. The males arrive first and stake out a territory of about one meter and defend it from other males. I should also make, like to make notice that uh, they find out through studies that 40% of all females that arrive at the vernal pool have already been bred much further away by males who are much further away from the vernal pools up to up to 75 yards in the case of the one that I found this year. After a male and a female pair up, a male deposits a spermatophore, which the female positions her cloakia over the sperm cap and picks up the seminal fluid, thus fertilizing the eggs. I do not have a picture of a marble spermatophore, but this is a spotted salamander spermatophores found in the water, just to give you an idea. In a normal year, when they show up for mating, they find the vernal pools dry. And uh, this was the very first nest that I ever found was under this log right here. And uh, I can't tell you how exciting that was, a female with her eggs. The females make a nest under logs by digging out a depression and deposit anywhere from 50 to 200 eggs. That was the first female I ever found with her eggs. And this is another female under the same log found about a week later. I'll go back to this one, but people insist to me that you can tell the, the males and females by the brighter colors. And, and here, you can, here you can plainly see that even females come in all different colors. And this, you know, at the first look, somebody told me was a male, and of course it's not, it's a female with her eggs. There's a clutch of eggs. Female brood the eggs and embryos to, till they develop to the hatching stage in about 15 days, but depending on, depending on conditions, high water, and weather, I have seen eggs and embryos that have taken up to a month to develop to the hatching stage. The following is from the wonderful book, Salamanders of the United States and Canada by James W. Prentrinka. Eggs will not hatch until they are inundated by water. When the eggs are covered by water, the embryos become oxygen starved. This triggers the release of a digestive enzyme that dissolves the egg capsule and allows the embryo to, to escape. So you can find hatch larvae from fall or not until the following spring, whenever the eggs become inundated by water. I have seen newly hatched larvae in October or not until February. What keeps these eggs and embryos from freezing through the long harsh winters like many things in nature is a mystery. I have read that females stay with the eggs until hatched inundated by water, but I have found that not to be the case. Depending on water levels, females leave the eggs in about a month, if not sooner. Unintended eggs are fine to develop on their own. I have seen females leave the nest in a matter of hours if the water is high and they feel threatened. In two years of 2017 and 18, when the marble got to their vernal pools for mating, they found them flooded with water. But the females know exactly what to do and make their nests at the margins of the water. There you can see this particular, this particular clutch is right along the edge in sphagnum moss. There are the eggs and the embryos. And this, this nest that I found was located on this little island in the middle of this water. I have also seen adult marbled upon reaching the normally dry vernal pools instead finding them full of water 
and anxious to mate, the males seemingly not know what to do, enter the water and drown. They are not the swimmers, their cousins, the spotted or Jeffersons are. Nest at the margins of the pool. This nest that I found was, was, excuse me. This particular nest was found right under that. I don't know why the pictures are advancing. Right under that particular log. This log right here. And there you can see her if you look in this nest of mud. Right there she is and there are some of her eggs. And there she is with her eggs. This was only a few days later and she was gone. But there's her eggs and they, like I said, they are fine to develop on their own. The problem with the females laying their eggs at the margins of the pools because they have no other choice is that a lot of the time the pools are already at their highest point and the eggs never become inundated with water, which is necessary for hatching. I have personally rescued eggs that I have found developed out of water by placing them back in the water so hatching can take place. Embryo development. Now this particular nest, it, this is a long video, I apologize, but you can see the, the embryos moving inside of the eggs. They are ready to hatch. They are just waiting to be inundated by water. And again, they cannot hatch until they are inundated by water, but they are fully developed. They have their eyes, their tails, the gills. They're just waiting for water, which, which they were flooded the following week and they were able to hatch. Again, this is a long video and I apologize. Keep your eye on this egg here. You can see the eye, the tail. There he goes. But there you can clearly see the eye and the tail. As I said, these are ready to hatch. There you can see the eye and the and the the, the forelimbs. Uh, something's wrong here that this just wants to advance on its own. I don't know what I'm doing. Ah. Uh. Now these, these embryos are not all, uh, all ready to the hatching stage. It just shows development. There's the tail. Maybe I should just not use the pointer. Maybe that's the problem. So we'll start over. You can see the eye, the forelimb. And again, these are not all ready to, to hatch. There you can see the gills, the eye, the tail. Again, you can see the eyes, the tail, the forelimbs are just starting to develop. There you can see 
on the side of its head a balancer, which we're going to talk about in a minute. The gills are just now developing. You can see that little point. I wish I could point to it. See what happens. There's, there's where the forelimb is going to be. There you can see the gills, the eye. There's a balancer on the side of its head. Here you can see the eye, the gills. I believe this guy's ready to hatch. It should be noted that because this nest was in sphagnum moss that kept the eggs clean and clear, that I was able to get these pictures of the embryos developing. Most nests are usually covered in soil and the eggs become soiled and it is almost impossible to follow embryo growth. I was very fortunate to locate these particular eggs. David, there's a question on the chat. Um, are they completely white when first starting to develop in the egg? Yes, yes. It doesn't take them but a week or so to, to, to go out of that stage and they start getting their color, their spots. But early on, they are white. But uh, if the eggs, and that's the case here, if the eggs become inundated by water before the embryos develop to the hatching stage, they will perish and die. And that's what happened to this particular nest. They weren't quite developed enough and got flooded and drowned. The following pictures and video were taken on November 21st, 2018, the day before Thanksgiving. A very cold 35 degrees and windy day, but it was one of the finest days in the field for me personally. The one thing I thought I would never get to see, the hatching of marbled salamander eggs. After carefully removing the top layer of sphagnum moss of a known nest that I've been watching since her first being found in October, there in the tiny pockets of water in the moss, I saw for the first time hatching larvae. What a privilege and humbling experience this was for me. It is times like these that I really get, that I am glad I, most times I am by myself because I really get excited. Sometimes the things I feel privileged to see in nature can bring me to tears. It can make me feel so small and insignificant. The wonder and power of nature can be so very humbling. As stated, when the embryos develop to the hatching stage, they will not and cannot hatch until covered by water. It can take a few hours or several days for the larva to hatch after becoming inundated by water, and the egg dissolves enough for hatching to occur. These are eggs in the process of hatching. There, you can see there's two, two embryos there, and the, the white thing here is an embryo that didn't develop. But up here you have two embryos that are just now hatching. And if you look closely, you can sort of see the A capsule around them. If you notice that little white thing moving around, that's a daphinia, a water flea. But there you can clearly see that what's left of the egg capsule around his tail. It's still curled up inside of his tail. So these are just starting to hatch. I would like to take a minute to talk about the amazing balancers. Last spring, I noticed some appendages on the head of developing Jefferson's embryos. I'm going to try this pointer thing again. But the, there's a little point there on his head. And later on the heads of, of hatched larvae, 
there you can clearly see them sticking out of the heads. Now that's a spotted salamander, has them too. I could not figure out what I was looking at, let alone what they were for. After some inquiries was sent the following fascinating explanation. The following is from the book Biology of Amphibians by William E. Dolman and Linda Trubb. Balancers are paired rod-like lateral projections that develop on the head of many palm-like larvae. In some species, they are absorbed before they hatch. In others, they persist until the developing forelimbs become fully functional, and during the interim, the balancers, along with the extended forelimbs, seem to keep the larva from sinking into the muddy substrate and help them maintain its balance during its first feeble attempts at locomotion using its forelimbs. They're like little tiny life preservers that help keep them balanced and afloat till their forelimbs develop with the things that nature provides. I realized I could not remember seeing them a marvel larva. Then again, last fall, due to the clean, clear eggs, I was excited to document balancers on the head of developing marbled embryos. There you can see the little projection on the side of his head. Those are the balancers. And there they are on the heads of the, of the uh, you can see them on the heads of the, the larva after they've hatched. Although not as pronounced as Jefferson's and marbled Jefferson's and spotted larvae, perhaps due to the fact that marble hatch which, with a much more developed forelimb. When Ambistomia pacman hatch, they are approximately 10 to 20 millimeters in length. That's about a half an inch. Larvae hatch without hind limbs and have gills for breathing underwater. They are more than capable of taking care of themselves. When small, larvae feed on zooplankton and small insects like water fleas, Daphinia, and many other tiny insects and their larvae. It's amazing to watch any tiny spot in a vernal pool for any amount of time, and you can see all manner of creatures that fill this water and call this wet environment home. I get a great deal of enjoyment just standing in the water, and it doesn't take you very long for you to become just another creature in the pool. It is so fascinating watching the tiny creatures interact with one another and I can stand and watch this for hours. These are all newly hatched larva pictures, but you can see the heart the intestines. There's the heart again. Notice the gray pigmented chin that marbled have. Uh, that's, that's the only larva that has that gray pigmented chin, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's a good way to tell larva apart, that in the time of the year when you're seeing larva here in the Northeast. If you're finding larva in fall and winter, the chances that it's marbled are pretty high. There's not much else it could be. And again, they have that gray pigmented chin. When, when the Jeffersons are spotted, it would be white. There you can see the ribs, what's left of the balancers. Now this ruler is not accurate. It's just to give you an idea. It's through the glass, but I wanted to put that in there just to give you an idea of the larva's size. I found this larva interesting. He's mostly all head and very little body. I, uh, I'm sure he developed fine, but he was an unusual shape. When tiny larvae spot something to eat, they simply get close enough and open their mouths quickly. This creates a suction that draws the tiny morsel into its mouth. This, this strategy, this is a strategy they will use for the rest of their lives as larvae when hunting prey. These next pictures are larvae through a 
through my photographic tank uh, were backlit. I rescued them from a tiny pool from an overflow stream from a vernal pool. There was 120 in this little pocket that I rescued, but it gave me a good opportunity to to put them in the tank and watch them through the sunlight. And you can see there, you can see the intestines, the heart. There's the pool that I rescued them. That's what the stream made. And there was, I said there was 120 in there trapped. And then I released them in the vernal pool, which would have been behind me. It's nice to see larvae this time of year on the colored leaves in the water. They should be hatching if we get inundated. There's, there's plenty of nests, plenty of eggs, and they're just waiting on water now. We do need water. These pictures that I'm going to show you now were taken under very thick ice um, in December. The ice was three inches thick, so the larvae moved away from the shallows where the ice was frozen solid to the ground and out into the middle. And I went out in the middle too, but uh, there they were under the ice. They're very slow and sluggish, but they're there. This was also taken under ice. When the water becomes cold, the larvae are very slow and growth rate really slows down. This next picture show many dead larvae with live larvae. This die out occurred in February of 2017. Right after the larva hatched, there was a sudden and sharp temperature drop that froze the vernal pool solid for a month. And I believe the larva having just hatched were shocked by the cold and also may have become oxygen starved. There were hundreds dead, but also many hundreds survived. There you can see the dead larva. And there's a live larva and the white, again, the white, the white areas are embryos that never developed. When the water starts to warm in March, the wood, the wood frogs return to the pool for breeding. When they lay their eggs, their eggs in turn become a favorite food source for the marbled larva. You can see hundreds congregating around the eggs, plucking the membrane off the egg masses. It seems to cause no harm to the eggs. And later on in April, when the spotted salamanders lay their eggs, they also can be found eating their eggs as well. So there is a definite advantage to being hatched and born in the fall the previous year. Now this is a this is a larva in with the spotted salamander eggs, eating them. This is wood frog eggs again. I'm always amazed. I'm always amazed. I'm always amazed how fast the larva seem to find these wood frog eggs. In a matter of hours, they're there. They also like to use the egg masses for cover and camouflage. David, we have another question, if you have a minute. How far do they travel from their birthplace in their lifetime? They really don't know. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. They really don't know, but they stay in close proximity to the vernal pools all their lives, and they are long-lived. Um, but they're finding that they not only do they use the same vernal pools year after year, they actually use the same route to and from the pools. Spotted salamanders also. It's very fascinating. They don't know if they're, it's a scent trail that they're following or landmarks, which I find hard to believe since they change every year. Um, but uh, they're, they're not only using the same vernal pools, but they're actually using the same routes to and from the pools. They are in close proximity uh to the vernal pools all their lives i hope that answers the question thank you uh one other question do the marbled salamanders eat the spotted larvae or do they munch on the egg membranes like they do with the wood frogs they they just seem to be uh, to be eating on the membrane uh, that's that's my take on it not the actual egg masses the eggs themselves 
Uh, does that answer the question? I think so. Thank you. How am I doing, Matthew? This is this is a marvel to watch, and I think we're just all on the edge of our seats. This is great, David. Well, thank you very much. It's a it's a lot of hours of being in the field, and I enjoy every minute of it. And it's nice to show show other folks what I've what I've seen and taken. Uh, again, I apologize for the pointer. It just seems to make the the pictures want to skip. I don't know why. <clears throat> I call him the mad larva. He's not real happy about this, but he's he's hiding, as you can see, in spotted salamander egg masses, as well as eating the membrane off them. And they're still eating water fleas at this time, which you can see there in the in the photographic tank. Another very interesting food, and I've seen marbled at little holes in February in the ice, their larva congregating there because it also the light and the heat draw in the fairy shrimp. So you can see the marbled at the holes dining on the fairy shrimp. This guy was eating well. He's a rather, rather large larva, but he was eating well. But here are the fairy shrimp. And you can also see she's carrying eggs in her little egg pouch there. I put this video in so you can see they're undulating. That's how they propel themselves through the water. I, when I again, when I found this hole in the ice in February, I, I could see larva almost out on the ice, and I couldn't understand why they were by the hole. Well, the the water was just red with fairy shrimp; they were just gorging themselves on them. And again, there's a fairy shrimp with her eggs in her pouch. I would like to mention at this time that I've seen three different Ambistomia larvae in vernal pools at different stages of development at the same time. The largest due to breeding in the fall is always the marbled, followed by the Jefferson, which breed in late winter, early spring, depending on ice out, and the spot at which you start to see again in, the, in March, depending on the weather. I included these pictures because it's a nice comparison. Here you have marbled salamander larva and spotted salamander embryos. And we could talk about it's fascinating that they've discovered now that there's a, they call it an endoscopic uh, relationship, that that larva is actually um, inside the egg developing. And that algae is growing inside the egg, but is also growing inside the embryo. And when the, when the embryo hatches in it and it eventually metamorphoses to land, that larva, that algae is actually found inside, living inside of the uh, spotted salamanders. They depend on each other. The algae right now is providing oxygen for the embryo. And in turn, uh, the uh, embryo is, 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 uh, is giving the algae nitrogen. I'm sorry about that. Um, so they depend on each other. And there's two, there's two creatures here actually living together. It's the first time that it's ever been documented. It's very fascinating. But again, these are marble larva with spotted salamander embryos. There you can really see the algae inside of the egg with these spotted embryos. Right now, I would like to talk about the amazing and mysterious ability that all salamander larvae have and adult salamanders have to regenerate damaged and missing limbs.
It is a hard world living in a vernal pool, but you can only imagine the applications to the medical field if scientists can unlock the secrets of larvae regenerating limbs one day. There are lots of predators feeding on salamander larvae. Snakes, I once witnessed a garter snake out on a log trying to catch larvae. Frogs, turtles, and raccoons to name a few. This is a picture of a green sedge caddis fly eating a larva alive. But the worst predator that I've found that does the most damage is other larvae. They can and do prey upon each other, not just preying on different species, but preying on the larvae of the same species. This next video, I, I put this uh, marble larva in my photographic tank with the Jefferson larva. When I got my camera situated to make some pictures, I couldn't find the Jeffersons anymore. The marble ate them. And uh, it all happened very quick. And this was, this was a rather large larva, but that marble ate him. But you can also see that he has a tail bite on his tail. So he's also been preyed upon himself. As I said, it's a hard world living in a vernal pool. This is a, a, lunis, a leucistic larva. You have to remember that to later on. It's, it's lost a lot of its pigment. But there you can see a, a tail bite that's in the process of regenerating. Here you can see a larva that's lost its gills and its forelimb. Again, it's lost its forelimb and gills. Again, it's lost gills and a forelimb. A forelimb is missing on this one. There, you, it, you find it very hard to find larva in any pool at any time that doesn't have some sort of injury to it. I, I included this picture because you can see what its forelimb should look like. And there on the other side, you can see that the toes are starting to regenerate where it lost its foot. There you can see a tail bite, which is very common. There you can see the foot is missing. Now I included this picture. This is a, a blue spotted salamander, but you can get a good comparison here of the what the toes and, and limbs should look like. And on the other side, you can just see the toes starting to regenerate. Amazing. Again, you can see the tail regeneration. By week 23 of their lives, the hind limbs are starting to make an appearance. They look like little paddles. By June of most years, the, the larvae are really starting their metamorphosis to adult salamanders. They're really getting large here. The larvae are really getting big now. At 50 millimeters, that's two inches, that's 40 millimeters of growth since hatching. And they are making frequent trips to the surface for gulps of air. as their lungs develop. In the southern US where ponds don't freeze, winters are mild, it takes three months for metamorphosis to take place. But here in PA, whereas in some instances, larva overwinter under ice, the growth rate really slows down and it can take up to eight months for metamorphosis to occur. And in a wet year, I have found larva into July and August, that's at least 10 months. In fact, it was almost time for the adults to be heading back to the pools to start their mating and the process to start all over again. It seems in these wet years of abundant water that larvae are almost seem hesitant to leave the relative safety of the water. In a normal year, as water levels drop, it seems to stimulate metamorphosis. Water levels seem to make a big difference as to when metamorphosis occurs. I included this picture because of the gills. You can see they're kind of backlit and they're pink full of blood to absorb the oxygen from the water. 
And here's a, here's a larva that's ready to leave the pond. His tail is taking on the tail shape that it will have for the rest of, the, of its life instead of the aquatic tail. You can see that the gills are all but gone and their eye sockets become much more pronounced for a life on land. I should mention that I have found in rare instances larvae that have been washed into vernal overfull streams and completed metamorphosis, feeding almost exclusively on spotted salamander eggs and also washing down with the larva. But for this to happen, a constant flow of water is needed. This guy metamorphosed in a little stream, but I think this is a rare occurrence. Here you can see larvae that are basically the same age, and you can see the one on the right has lost his gills, and the one on the left still has his gills. Just different, different stages of metamorphosis. Now when you see this, they call this the gullier flap underneath the chin. I can't find an explanation for it anywhere. But uh, when you see this, and he, again, you can see he's lost his gills, that he's ready to leave the pool, and look, and the eye sockets are so much more pronounced. But he, can you he's spell, with, David, can you spell the name of that flap for us so we can G-U-L-A-R. I've talked to several uh, prominent folks and they, they give me different explanations. And in the end, I, I, don't, I don't really think they know. I, my explanation is it, it's to help them turn their heads and move them up and down in a life on land. But I could be all wrong. I could be all wrong. By the end of June and most years, metamorphosis has been completed and the larvae leave their watery home as metamorphous juvenile salamanders and a life on land never to return to the water again. At best, an uncertain future. This is always both a happy and a sad time for me as I have been watching the larva grow for a long time and in some cases since the previous fall. The few larvae that are left by the end of June are the last of their kind for, for the year. I always feel privilege watching them grow and face all the predators that feed on them and also watching them become predators themselves. Careful digging in the leaf litter reveals recently metamorphosed marbled salamanders. I took video of this guy, but he really doesn't have time for that. He has other salamanders to meet. He has no time for video. I included these next pictures. I was privileged to take pictures of juvenile marbled salamanders uh, from Georgia, where they metamorphose in a matter of three months. You wouldn't see this in Pennsylvania this, this early. But uh, these are not very old, perhaps three to five months old, and they already have the adult colorations. But again, these were taken in, from salamanders in Georgia. Marbled salamanders are ready to breed for the first time in anywhere from one to five years. For me personally, I have found very few adult aipacmen throughout the year, other than breeding season. The adults lead a secretive life away from the vernal pools and not much is known about their lives. But they do seem like other salamanders to be on the move on rainy nights, especially after a long dry spell. If there has been sufficient rainfall, this will make the adults more active and visible closer to the surface. Adults can be found in moist leaf litter under damp logs. In drier times, adult salamanders can be found living up to 40 inches underground. That was my very first adult marbled. Uh, I can't tell you how thrilling that was for me. I included this picture. This is a female that has all white spots on her. No cross bands or bars at all, except up at the head. 
Adult salamanders are preyed upon by many animals, including snakes, raccoons, and owls, and many other predators. It has been observed that when A. pacman feels threatened, it will secrete a milky substance from its tail for defense. This is something that I have personally never witnessed as I try to avoid handling adults, not to cause them any harm. I always wear protective gloves in the field to protect anything I might handle. This was a male in September on his way to the vernal pool. Really brightly colored. And I'd like to point something out here in a minute. Um, well, you can, you can see this uh, pouch under his, uh, that's a good way to tell a male and a female apart um, if you don't wanna handle them and I don't recommend you do. If you could just look at them from the side, males always have this engrossed cloakia and, and swollen behind the hind limbs. Females don't have that. That's a, a good way to tell male and female apart. Marbled salamander diet consists of, a mother, among other things, worms, grubs, insects of all kinds, and insect larvae. How long do marbled salamanders live? No one knows for sure. But I have heard stories about children collecting spotted salamanders, cousin to the marbled, and putting them in a tank and keeping it. When the children grow up and go off to college, the parents are left to care for the salamanders. They are very, very long lived. And when you, when you study uh, breeding and mating areas and their chances of larva developing, it's no wonder because you can have embryos developed to the hatching stage and they never get inundated and they never hatch. And you can also have embryos that are developing and they get flooded and they drowned. And you might not have any in some years and in, in several years actually. So it can take a, take a good many years of trying to breeding for them to have success at uh, their larva metamorphosis to adults. Uh, I put some comparison pictures in here. Now that underneath is the spotted larva, on top is the marble. They're almost always darker than marble. But again, you can see that pronounced eye socket and see how dark it is under the chin. And you can see how white it is under the chin of the spotted. Marbled on the left, spotted on the right. Spotted on top, marbled underneath. Again, the marbled are almost always darker and their spots are a lot more vivid on, on, in the uh, marbled. I put this picture in just so you can see my photographic tank. Um, there's a larva in there, uh, Jefferson's I put in to take pictures and out of the woods out of nowhere came that green frog and he had a, he was fixated on that larva in my tank. He thought he had himself an easy meal. Wherever that larva went, he was watching. If you are interested in looking for salamanders and amphibians in Pennsylvania, you are required to have a current fishing license. And if you do go out and explore any wet areas, I would strongly encourage you to visit the Pennsylvania Amphibian Reptile Survey, PARS, website and follow decontamination procedures. It is very important to avoid spreading our germs to the, and diseases to the important fragile areas. They rec rec uh, recommend a chlorexidine right now, which you can get at tractor supply and mix with water. I spray my tank, my gloves, my boots. I spray everything with chlorexidine. I think this presentation shows that we can all make a difference in our natural world. Unfortunately, we live in a world where we are told everything is already known and there's nothing left to discover. And it is just not so. Each and every one of us can make a difference in our understanding and preservation of nature. There is always something new to learn and I encourage everyone to go out and start to watch anything that interests them in nature and write down what you see and observe. Whether a bird, plant, animal or tiny insect, and then every one of us can make a big difference. It is important to remember when fall rains come that the marbled are stimulated to travel to pools to breed and that the same fall rains are used by spotted salamanders and other amphibians to move away from the vernal pools for winter. So marbled and spotted salamanders can pass each other on those rainy nights heading in opposite directions. And the following spring, the opposite will happen as the marble leave their breeding areas for the summer and the spotted head to the vernal pools for mating for the summer. 
Salamanders and other amphibians really depend on these rainy nights for migration, so please be aware when driving on those nights. I would like to, this time to thank my wife, Beverly, for all her 38 years of support. Speaking of, of, of finding things out new all the time, this, this fall I was privileged to be out at night on September the 5th in a rainy night, very rainy night, and I captured two males fighting over territory, something I had never witnessed before. It was fascinating to watch. There's lots of tail slapping, head butting, trying to get under one another to gain an advantage. Again, this was in a driving rain. All the years that I've been studying this salamander, I had never seen anything like this before. We have two additional questions, David, once these are done fighting. Well, I, I would like to say that when I listened to it later and turned up the volume, you can hear barks and squeaks. Now, wow. is it my camera equipment? I, I don't know, but I think it should be look, looked into. But there's definitely sound going on. I'd be glad to play it again. But uh, um, I was told by a lady who raises tiger salamanders, which is, which, is a, which is a cousin to the marbled. And she says, when you irritate salamanders in their, in their little areas, that they do, they do make sounds like barks, barks and chirps. So I was very fortunate. What I'm sorry. Uh, so we had a request for the name of the disinfectant that you used. How do you spell it? And also, why do you need a fishing license? You have to talk to our Pennsylvania Fish Commission about that. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. But I, I have been up in Tioga County in the northern part of the state, basically in the middle of Nowheresville. And there came a fish warden and questioning me what I was doing. I, I told him I was looking for salamanders and he made me produce my license. And uh, I, uh, that, that's just the, the law here. I don't know how it is everywhere else. I, hang on a minute. I brought, I brought the uh, chlorexidine here so everybody could see it. Thanks for bearing with me. I don't know if you can see this. That's how it comes. But you you mix very little of it in water, and then can, I put can it you in turn it so we can see the label? I can Thank spell you. it too. I was always told it was in the uh, horse section and tractor supply, but actually, it's in the cattle section. It's just like Jeanette wrote in the chat. Yep, she had it right all along. Thank you. Can you? Everybody got that? Is that good? Yes. Thank you. Actually, uh, when I had my knee surgery some years ago, I had a, I had to bathe myself in the same solution from a drugstore, and they're they're the gloves that I use from CVS. I get paid for advertising. They don't want you using latex anymore. And uh, the lunistic salamander I showed you earlier, um, I got to watch him grow up in that vernal pool some years ago. And this fall and in the rain, there I was an adult. It, man, it was very exciting to see something like that. Um, is it the same larva that I, I'd watched growing up several years ago? Probably not, but you never know. I like to think it was. 
Here I included my card, my website for my pictures. I also have a uh, site on Facebook group with over 2,000 members now. I expected 40. Friends of the Marbled Salamander, I encourage anyone with an interest in this amazing creature to join and share their experiences. And again, thanks for having me. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. That was really awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks to Russ. Um, I very much appreciate being asked. I got my photographic tank incidentally at Carolina Biological Supplies and they now they discontinued it. And I am trying to find somebody who can build me another one. I I depend on it. And one of these days, I've had it for so long, it's just going to come apart. It's just sheet, two sheets of glass with a plastic frame, an aquarium frame, I've been told. You're getting lots of appreciation and gratitude in the chat messages. This was an amazing talk. This was amazing. Thank you. Thanks so much. Your attention to detail is really wonderful. So people are very pleased by this, David. It was really something well, special well thank you all very much um i um i'm very interested in this and uh i think i always of course will be and every every outing it seems like you learn something new and uh and we're never going to know everything and that's just fine well said are there any other questions for david I can do my best to answer them. I hope I have so far. But I've learned a lot just this, this past fall in being out in the rain. Uh, it started on September the 5th here. And I think I, I saw 70 that night at one, one corner of one vernal pool, 70 mostly males, some females. Wow. Um, it was it was really something to see. You really had to be careful not to step on anything. And I decided to get out of there and not even look around any further. I was so afraid of stepping on something. A um, couple, th couple of questions coming in and one recommendation. If you can uh, see the chat window, David, there's someone who's recommending a, an approximate re replacement for your photo tank. I can send you that link later if you don't see it. And then we have a question. Did you say that they live up to 40 yards underground? And another question, are they bothered by light at night? They don't seem to be bothered by light at all at night, even in, in non-breeding seasons. Um, and no, that was 40 inches underground in a dry year. 40 inches. Yeah. And what was the other one? So I don't see some, I don't see these questions. Yeah, that's what I thought. So someone is recommending uh, a photarium from the Wild Fish Conservatory. Uh, I'll send you the link later. I'll just I'll email it to you after this is over. Uh, as you as you were mentioning that your photo tank uh, might need to be replaced. Boy, I, I would very much appreciate any any help or information on that. Yeah, I've copied the link and I'll, I'll email it to you after we're done. But, here. Uh, and then in subsequent uh, nights in, in the rain again, it seems you need to have a wet night. Um, I did get to see other salamanders and uh, watch their interactions and it was, nothing seems to bother them. Uh, I certainly didn't. But one of the last nights I, I, I hadn't seen anything. And then uh, I, I'm guessing 75, a good 75 yards away from the vernal pool across a road in the forest was a, this giant male. And I found out later on that studies have shown that 40% uh, of the females have already been, have already made it before they get to the vernal pool. Mm -hmm. And I am sure that's what that male was doing there, so far away from the pool, just sitting on the leaves, waiting to intercept females. He was very, yeah, I'm sure he was very old. It was the biggest male I had, biggest marbled salamander I had ever seen. Wow. I'm sorry I don't have the pictures on this yet, but. Uh, if you if you go to my uh, my site on on friends of the marbled salamander, you're certainly going to see him. And if you go to my uh, nature photography www.davidjhand.com, you're certainly going to see a lot more pictures of the marble from this fall. That sounds excellent. I'm sure we'll all go check that out. I know I will. I'm going to look at those.
Russ wants to know if you have a favorite mole salamander. If I have a favorite mole salamander, uh, it would be the marbled. <laughs> <laughs> It would be I think we I think he set that one up. I think you. I think that was a trick question. <laughs> um No, I'm I'm very happy uh and happy to do it whenever you like. I'm I appreciate very much being asked. Thank and I you appreciate so much. you all paying attention and bearing with me. And uh Thank you so much. That was enlightening and just aesthetically beautiful pictures to look at just really really great work thank you for what you do and thank you for paying attention to the world around you and sharing it with us so that we can learn from it i think i think we've addressed everybody's questions so i think we are good to go thank you all for your time thank i appreciate you, it thank you very much david it was really good thank you russ thank you very much that means a lot to me great presentation loved it loved it loved it Thank you. Thank you very much. Much appreciated, David. So that's it or? That's it. Okay. Well, thank you, Matthew. <laughs> I'm going to end the meeting now, unless anyone has any uh, sort of last minute business they want to bring to my attention. Well, please, please go to my nature picture website or again, Absolutely. join the friends of the marbled salamander. We'd love to have it. you. Yeah, that's a great resource for us. Thank you so much. Have a good night now. <laughs>